optical. Welcome back, very nice song. Now we turn our attention to the National Day of Canada and we welcome His Excellency Ambassador Ariel Deloya. Welcome back again, Your Excellency. Thank you. Do you know that RTC is the only radio station in North Africa where you can speak in French, then in English in less than one hour? Perfect. <laughs> uh, Your Excellency, uh, RTC family is celebrating the National Day of Canada. How does the Canadian Embassy and the community celebrate the exceptional day? Well, the, um, the embassy has uh, a national celebration or uh, a reception to mark the National Day. We did that uh, on Friday evening since the holiday actually falls today and we don't normally do receptions on, on weekends. Mm -hmm. um, so we had about 250 people at the embassy on Friday night, uh, Canadians, Tunisians, uh, members of the diplomatic corps, and uh, it was a lovely evening. We had uh, good, um, you know, good company and uh, mm -hmm. we had a chance to uh, talk to a lot of our closest friends, the ones that we work with on a regular basis. And uh, for us, uh, I'm speaking more personally, it was mm -hmm. a, a particularly memorable evening because um, it was our last one uh, for Canada Day in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Since um, mm -hmm. my assignment is coming to a close, I've been here a little more than, uh, sorry, a little less than three years, almost three years, mm -hmm. and I'll be leaving uh, shortly. Um, so it was a, a more emotional national day, only because it's the last one we'll spend uh, in Tunisia, at least as ambassador. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, don't you think that your presence here is the proof that things have changed in the new Tunisia after the revolution? Absolutely. I, I can't imagine uh, being uh, interviewed on uh, national radio uh, without any kind of control mm -hmm. under the old uh, system. Um, I mean. We noticed that, if you recall, on the evening of uh, January 13th, when the former uh, ruler spoke and said, you know, henceforth things would be more free and more liberal, mm -hmm. and literally that evening, you know, uh, in a matter of his speech, uh, in a few minutes of his speech, uh, the internet became uh, unblocked, uh, mm -hmm. and people were on television debating uh, real political issues and being able to voice their opinions without fear of political or other consequence. So um, we felt that, obviously, and it, uh, I have to admit, it made our job mm -hmm. more challenging because overnight we went from a situation where we were in a very controlled environment, as of course Tunisians mm -hmm. themselves were, sure. and uh, found ourselves uh, with entire uh, areas of Tunisian society now suddenly open and accessible to us that were previously inaccessible to us. The media, civil society, mm -hmm. young people, uh, political parties other than the ruling party. Um, so all of that changed literally in, in a matter of hours, mm -hmm. um, and I have to admit it made uh, our jobs uh, far more interesting, uh, being in that kind of an environment. Than have you had the, the opportunity to go to the regions? Yes, absolutely. I've been through most of the country. I've done the far south, I've done most of the coast, I've done the interior, I've done the northwest. Uh, I mean, there are a few little places I probably haven't been to, but I've seen probably 18 of the 20, what is it, 24 governments. 24. So I've seen, I've seen, you know, a good number of uh, mm -hmm. places. But what's more important is that I've met a lot of people in those places. I've met, you know, local people, people that we try and help uh, as modestly as we can with mm -hmm. small-scale uh, aid projects. Uh, I've met local officials, governors, mayors, uh, uh, delegates, and others, delegates, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, it's been really interesting to, to be able to, especially in the period since the revolution, to be able to go to other parts of the country mm -hmm. and talk to Tunisians in a way that, again, was not always that easy yeah. uh, previously. I mean, it was done, but it was done with extraordinary supervision and control and with police, political police, uh, often... You're not confined. necessarily free to circulate and to talk to people now about their are. daily problems. Yeah, now we are, and, mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's been a much more rewarding part of the experience. You, you were based in Tunis and in Tunisia at a crucial period in the history of the country and the region as well, not only Tunisia. Is this a challenge for the ambassador and the embassy staff? It was, particularly I would say last year uh, around this time we were really felt, feeling the pressure 
well, not just because of what was happening in mm -hmm. Tunisia, but as you correctly point out, what was happening in the region was having consequences here. And I'll give you an exact example. Yes, please. When the conflict in Libya began mm -hmm. a few months after Ben Ali was chased from office here, uh, we ended up having to close our embassy in Tripoli. We mm -hmm. closed our embassy at the end of February 2011. Um, we didn't relocate staff, we mm -hmm. closed our embassy, the staff that were in Tripoli went back to Canada. But there were a number of Canadian citizens, many of them dual citizens with Libyan citizenship, mm -hmm. who were coming to Tunisia since there was no embassy to go to in Tripoli yeah. for, yeah. for consular assistance, for help getting visas, for family members. We were getting a lot of Libyans, not Canadians, just Libyans, mm -hmm. wanting you know, to apply for visas to go to Canada. Our volume of work, without exaggeration, increased by about 50% from about uh, April to September when Gaddafi finally mm -hmm. fell. Uh, I mean, it was bad enough that uh, there were employees that uh, were close to burning out, and uh, mm -hmm. it was a real strain. And I suspect that was true for a lot of other Western embassies that also had closed their missions in, in Tripoli. Um, so it had implications. But at the same time, having been here when the revolution here happened, mm -hmm. I was part of a group along with my colleague in Tripoli and my colleague in Cairo who internally worked to identify what were the lessons we learned from our respective experiences um, that could serve other Canadian ambassadors that might face similar situations. Sure. So when it happened in, in Syria, when world. it happened in, yeah. in other places, you know, there were Yemen. a few of us that they could, well, we didn't have an embassy yeah, in Yemen, at that time, yeah, sure. but we, we had a few, you know, my colleague in Damascus was able to uh, you know, benefit from the experience that my colleagues in Cairo, Tripoli, and I had had mm -hmm. dealing with uh, the pressures of a revolution or significant political change. Which challenges have you faced in dealing with the government before the revolution? Well, before the revolution, um, the, the, the major challenge was that this was a very closed government. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just closed with respect to Tunisians, it was closed with everyone. Uh, I spoke to, you know, I would speak to my Arab diplomatic colleagues would say it was no easier for them to find out what was happening in Tunisia, talk to people in the government of Tunisia, than it was for us. Basically, and I don't want to be unkind, but uh, I think this is not a secret for most Tunisians, mm -hmm. the former regime basically had two objectives. Its first was preserving itself in power. The second, I think evidently, when you look at the evidence around us, was trying to uh, take as much uh, in the countries of the country's wealth and resources as it could mm -hmm. for the longest period of time. So entertaining diplomatic relations, cooperating with foreign partners on matters of policy, whatever, was not really its interest. I mean, it was impossible. Well, it wasn't impossible, but you know, to get an appointment with uh, a mid-level official of the ministry was very complicated. It would take mm -hmm. weeks, and and when you met them, they never said anything. They because they couldn't say anything unless they had a script that was approved by Carthage, mm -hmm. and so uh, you basically went and had not dialogues but monologues. You spoke, mm -hmm. they said nothing, and at the end they would say, you know, thank you very much, that was a very interesting ambassador. We'll make sure to give, convey the information upwards. And you never heard anything further. So Your Excellency, how did you react to the revolution as, uh, as an ambassador and as a citizen, as a Canadian citizen as well? Well, I had, um, as, a, as any ambassador would have had, I had to deal with a number of competing concerns. I had to deal with the safety of my people, my employees, mm -hmm. and my mission, the physical yeah. property that we are responsible for. Um, I had to constantly assess, and it was, as you can recall, I mean, things were moving very quickly, and events were happening very rapidly. Um, so I had to constantly remain as informed as I could mm -hmm. to feed information back to Ottawa, uh, to give Ottawa a sense of what was happening, what it meant for us, what it meant for our interests. Um, so that's on a, on a sort of a macro level. On another level, um, once the revolution happened, I had to worry about the 500 or so Canadians that were that are in Tunisia, either living here as dual citizens or because they work here, or Canadians that just happen to be passing through. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as you can imagine, the, a lot of those Canadians, as indeed a lot of other foreign nationals, were concerned, trying to get out, wondering, you know, what embassies could do for them and so on. So there were a number of things one had to juggle. Um, you know, it was kind of like juggling. You had mm -hmm. a number of balls to keep in the air at the same time and try and avoid having any of them fall. Yeah. Um, but it happened uh, so quickly, frankly, that uh, you know, when you compare it to even Egypt or sure. certainly Libya, 
it happened so quickly that um, you know there were probably 72 to 96 hours that were really intense mm -hmm. and then things started to calm down and you know and then you just had to deal with different challenges and different parties. Your Excellency, do you think the, uh, the image of Tunisian immigrants in Canada has changed after the revolution? I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, there, there's a population of about 15 to, 25, 15 to 20,000 Tunisians, dual citizens or Tunisians, mm -hmm. living in Canada. Most of them live probably in the province of Quebec. Um, we haven't had any particularly difficult issues arise with Tunisian citizens, like a lot of other migrant populations, they're hardworking, they're, you know, they go about their business without uh, drawing attention. Um, so we didn't really have any issues in that sense. I think what the revolution did wasn't really so much put the spotlight on Tunisians living in Canada mm -hmm. as just uh, awaken Canada and Canadians to the fact that, you know, there's a country in the middle of North Africa called Tunisia that's, you know, where things are happening. And, mm -hmm. and not only where things are happening, but where because of what's happened in Tunisia, there is now a hope for the kind of change in a region that mm -hmm. a lot of us have longed for and hoped to see for a long time. Greater democracy, greater participation of young people, women, um, you know, greater uh, space for expression and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, these are values that are profoundly Canadian. They don't make a difference whether, you know, they, they don't change because you're Canadian of Tunisian origin or Italian origin or, or any other origin. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in that sense, uh, Tunisia is probably more uh, more known now in Canada mm -hmm. than it probably was before the revolution because a lot of Canadians will now know that Tunisia was kind of the, the catalyst for what's yeah. been happening in the region. Do you think this facilitates the integration of Tunisian immigrants in Canada? I don't think that, I don't think there's a real link between what happened in Tunisia and the integration of uh, Tunisians in, in Canada. We've done reasonably well as a country integrating immigrants from wherever they come mm -hmm. um, because we have, as a matter of policy, uh, an emphasis on multicultural integration, mm -hmm. on um, respecting and valuing differences between people, celebrating differences. Um, and we generally do a very good job, I think, uh, without too much false modesty, mm -hmm. in ensuring that new Canadians, wherever they come from, if they don't already speak the language, have access to you know, classes so that they can learn the language. That's usually not a problem mm -hmm. for Tunisians because many of them, most of them, speak French. Um, uh, employment opportunities, uh, schooling opportunities, are not conditioned on whether you're of a particular origin or whether you've been in Canada two years as, as opposed to twenty years or, mm -hmm. or or three generations. So. In that sense, um, I think our experience is somewhat different from the experience of a number of other countries. Mm -hmm. You know, there are only about three or four countries in the world, Canada is one of them, that have what I call an active immigration policy, that value immigration for the sake of immigration. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, I think, broadly mm -hmm. share similar values yeah. about the need for immigration, both to reinforce the richness and diversity of our respective countries, and because it brings with it economic vitality, economic prosperity, and so on. Mm -hmm. So we make an effort when we bring people to Canada uh, to do the best we can in ensuring that they have the same range of opportunities that anyone else has, mm -hmm. uh, whether they live you know, in a rural region or a city, whether they live in a populated province or an underpopulated province. Those things don't make much of a difference. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would argue that um, when we have migrant populations uh, being sponsored, for example, by refugee groups, church groups, and so on. Um, in some ways, they're better integrated than others because these groups that sponsor them will mm -hmm. go to extra lengths yeah. to make sure that you know the families are well provided for, that they have you know uh, an, an opportunity to have gainful employment, and that. And, that, mm -hmm. and then I think that just makes the chances of uh, succeeding better. I've received hundreds of emails and uh, messages this morning. Uh, people are asking about the immigration procedure to, to, mm. to Canada. Some people claim there it's l too long and costly. Well, it, it has been lengthy at times. Um, part of the problem is a simple supply and demand problem. Mm -hmm. The demand for uh, immigration uh, outstrips uh, the resources we have in terms of people to process the applications. Uh, we have a, a ministry, a, a department of citizenship and immigration mm -hmm. with staff around the world, including at my embassy, 
um, who uh, look after both immigrant applications and visa applications. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty sizable uh, workload. Um, so yes, there are times, lengthy waiting times, just because, again, it's, you know, the time it takes to get to an application. Um, in terms of fees, the fees, I don't think, uh, I'm not an expert on the fees, but I believe they're very comparable to the fees that other countries charge. Mm -hmm. and these are fees that are charged to ensure that there is some degree of cost recovery for the cost of maintaining uh, a significant uh, group of employees mm -hmm. whose job it is to process and, uh, and uh, check these applicants. Uh, you know, an application is not just a matter of going to one immigration officer, having an interview and determining on the basis of what the application says, whether mm -hmm. the person meets the requirements for permanent residency or not. It's a question, you know, you have to check, you know, if they have medical issues, you have to check if there are security questions yeah, sure. otherwise. I mean, all of that takes time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing, our Minister of Immigration uh, has done a remarkable job in the last... Uh, year or two years that he's been in, in that job, um, trying to make important, long overdue, needed reforms to the system to, among other things, make it more efficient, make it less uh, onerous, less time consuming. Um, it's not a perfect science, there's still for us a lot of work to be done, mm -hmm. but I think we have a, a minister who understands A, the value of immigration, and mm -hmm. B, who knows that you know there are elements of the system that need reform, that need being uh, need upgrading and uh, and who's been going about that with uh, a lot of determination and a lot of uh, good judgment. Works and studying in Canada is the dream of thousands of Tunisian students who don't necessarily have the means. Um, is the Canadian Embassy aware of this problem and are you planning to provide more scholarships? Um, we have a lot of interest, you're absolutely right, in terms of education in Canada, not just in Tunisia but around the world. Mm -hmm. um, for the obvious reason, and again, I don't want to sound immodest, but you know, Canada's education system is, is very strong, very well reputed. Um, Canadian universities uh, are often among the top 100, 500, depending on the rankings mm -hmm. um, in the world. Um, so it's not a surprise to see that you know people from around the world want to study in Canada, and we're quite keen to have as many foreign students as possible come to Canada. Mm -hmm. Again, contributes to the diversity that we seek to promote in our universities. Um, and it's an important uh, uh, source of potential um, growth for the country in the way that, in the sense that some of these uh, students will often choose to stay in Canada and contribute to Canada by becoming permanent residents and mm -hmm. eventually citizens. In terms of the cost, uh, well, first of all, there are very, very few scholarship programs that the federal government is involved in only because um, education in Canada is not a federal uh, responsibility, it's a provincial responsibility. Yeah. So the federal government's involvement in post-secondary secondary education consists principally of funding or, or transferring sums of money from the federal government to the provinces to finance part of the cost of post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. The actual administration of universities, uh, enrollment criteria vary from university to university. Universities are not run by the government, they're yeah. autonomous institutions, they're private. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're public, but they're, they're run you know, individually. Um, some universities offer scholarships, many of them available to foreign students as well as Canadian students. Some provinces, Quebec, I know, does this, um, offer not necessarily some scholarships, but more importantly what they offer some foreign students is the possibility of studying and paying the same student fees and mm -hmm. tuition fees that a Canadian or a Quebec student would pay. Yeah. Uh, and there's a big difference. Sure. Canadian students, uh, you know, if they're paying, let's say, uh, $1,500 for their uh, year of study at the university, um, that same university will charge a foreign student ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. It's not designed to be like that. The reason why it's like that is that the cost that is charged to a Canadian student reflects, among other things, the transfer yeah payments that I spoke of earlier from the federal government to the provincial government, and so in effect it's taxpayers subsidizing Canadians to mm -hmm. study. Uh, obviously foreign students, since they're not usually taxpayers, pay a closer, uh, a sum closer to the actual value of, or cost of uh, mm -hmm. university education. Um, but in terms of getting information, I think the best advice I would give to prospective students is to contact the universities that they're interested in, mm -hmm. or go to their websites, I mean today everyone has well-detailed websites, 
go to the website of the University of your choice. There are probably going to be uh, button bars for scholarships, mm -hmm. and bursaries. Um, the provinces will offer some bursaries and scholarships. Bursaries are, of course, loans that have to be repaid, but mm -hmm. generally on pretty flexible terms. Um, but there's no reason for um, uh, a foreign student wishing to go to Canada not to be able to afford it, especially if you know it's a choice between going to Canada and say going to uh, a European university or an American university, mm -hmm. where the costs either of living or of actual tuition yeah. are likely to be as expensive, if not more expensive, than they are in Canada. One last question about education, Your Excellency. Many students are studying Canadian literature in English or in French. Dozens have called this morning to ask the following question. Why don't you provide the Canadian corner or library with hundreds or even thousands of books? Um, those who can truly really travel to Canada could at least conduct research while in Tunis. Well, one of the things that has changed uh, in the last many years, in the last 15, 20 years, certainly since I've been in, in the diplomatic service, is that where we once had, in many cases, in embassies, uh, you know, modest resources of the sort you just described, books, mm -hmm. um, you know, encyclopedias, that sort of thing. Um, the reality is that we can no longer, frankly, afford doing that in missions around the world. Um, even in major centers, uh, we're closing or reducing uh, the cultural footprint that we have. Why? Well, one of the reasons is affordability. Um, mm -hmm. We're not immune to the same uh, challenges that other fa countries are facing right now while we've come out of the economic crisis in slightly better shape than a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. um, we have a government that uh, made a decision, as a lot of other Western governments did in 2008-9, uh, to stimulate the economy, to avoid having the bottom fall out from the economy. Mm -hmm. um, that temporarily took us from a situation where we were recording annual budget surpluses to a situation where we're now in deficit. The government has uh, uh, vowed that it uh, will eliminate its operating deficit by the year 2015-16 mm -hmm. without imposing taxes, without cutting the transfers I spoke of earlier to the provinces, and that leaves uh, basically government spending as one of the major vehicles for keeping costs uh, government. Costs but to be fair, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, spending restraints that I've been describing that mm -hmm. affect uh, cultural programs, for example, predate this government. They've been ongoing, as I say, for a good part of my career. The reality also, though, is that in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, the world was a very different place than it was in 1982 or 1992. Um, you're right, you don't necessarily have the opportunity to go to a Canadian embassy in Tunis or elsewhere and sit down at a library and consult books. But in this day and age, you can find pretty much any information you're looking for on the internet. So for most, uh, in, for most individuals interested in finding more about Canada or about Canadian literature or about a particular mm -hmm. field, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be Canadian. Um, there are resources that are open today that didn't exist, frankly, mm -hmm. not that long ago, that I think compensate a little bit for that. Not necessarily a perfect substitute. So you think they are available? I think there are things that are available. Um, you know, the, it probably requires a little bit more um, research. But it's it's not beyond the grasp of anyone to, to go to the internet and find a lot of information that they might have gone to mm -hmm. a library for. I'll give you an example. In yes, my own in my right. own department, mm -hmm. uh, the headquarters of our foreign ministry, we used to have uh, a major library which I use actually as a student. Um, that library no longer exists now because, uh, well, for all sorts of reasons, uh, the demand was no longer very significant. The costs outweighed mm -hmm. the demand. We needed the space for other functions. Um, a lot of the collection that the department had still exists. It's been mm -hmm. transferred to the National Library of Canada. And so instead of going to the Department of Foreign Affairs Library, you can go to the National Library and find a lot of uh, records relevant to the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, but of course, a lot of the things I've just also spoken about, you can find online. You can mm -hmm. find online a lot of official documents from the Department of Foreign Affairs that have been put online in the last five or ten years. Your Excellency, where is the priority of Canadian officials when they discuss investment in Tunisia? Well, I mean, it's not a question of where the government's priorities are, it's a question of where business people's priorities are. Mm -hmm. uh, as a government, we don't particularly invest, nor do we uh, direct Canadian companies where to invest. Um, but if I look at the pattern of investment in Tunisia right now, uh, there's a, an obvious 
uh, interest on the part of Canadian companies in Tunisia's oil and gas sector. Not terribly surprising, Canada has, as you know, the second or third world's largest proven oil reserves. Mm -hmm. They have a very dynamic oil and gas sector uh, based principally in Western Canada. And a lot of the, you know, so we have a lot of companies active in, in Canada with a lot of expertise in oil exploration, uh, oil services, and so on. And some of them are active in Tunisia. In that sector, we're the second largest investor in Tunisia after the British. After the British, um, so that's not bad for for our presence in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Frankly, what I'd like to see is uh, Canadian companies get in, uh, invest, and diversify their investments beyond the oil and gas sector. Um, you know, we can help Canadian companies, and we do when they come to us and seek market advice, seek uh, uh, help, uh, meeting contacts, and so on in Tunisia. Um, but we're not business people. We can't do the job of mm -hmm. business people in terms of identifying where their interests lie and pursuing them. Your Excellency, there's one final question that I have to ask. Otherwise, people will think that I'm just doing propaganda without asking the right questions. Um, I'm sure that you expect this question. There's a debate in the Tunisian media and the public opinion is divided about the fate of Belhassan Tarbelsi. Could we expect an extradition in the coming months? Well, I can't, um, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to, by, by virtue of the Canadian Privacy Act, I can't really talk about individual cases. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say is that um, extradition is always a bit of a complicated matter, only because, uh, as you know, countries sometimes have extradition treaties mm -hmm. and sometimes don't. Uh, in the case of Canada and Tunisia, we don't have a bilateral extradition treaty. Having said that, um, there are other ways for mm -hmm. us to cooperate in matters involving, let's say, extradition um, through UN conventions to which we're both party, the Convention on Organized Crime, notably, and, and um, there's one other convention, I forget the name of it. Mm -hmm. um, but there are multilateral channels that enable us to cooperate. Um, in terms of, um, of individual cases, I'm, as I say, I'm not really in a position to talk about individual cases. What I will say, though, is um, I'll tell you what I did uh, yes, please. Yeah. after the revolution. As soon as the revolution happened, um, within literally a day of the revolution happening, I went into the office and immediately started working on a list of, eventually it grew to about 150 names, mm -hmm. of Tunisian uh, individuals, members of the presidential family, members of the presidential in-law family, uh, people very close to the old regime, uh, that I worried about uh, either having Canadian visas already, mm -hmm. or trying to get Canadian visas yeah. to get to Canada, mm -hmm. uh, or trying in some other way to flee to Canada. Uh, and what I did is I immediately sent to Ottawa a list of people I, I basically suggested we watch out for. And within about you know, 24, 48 hours, a number of these individuals were in a database in Canada in such a way that if they tried to arrive at any Canadian embassy, whether it's here or or it's anywhere else, mm -hmm. and try to but apply for a visa, mm -hmm. uh, the officer treat, uh, treating their request would immediately see a flag next to their name saying, do not make any decision on this person without checking with Ottawa first. Uh, and that was to avoid the kinds of scenarios yeah. you've described. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not a foolproof system. The Prime Minister, in fact, spoke about the case you mentioned uh, shortly after um, the revolution, he was in Morocco on an official visit and someone asked him a question about it and he was very c categorical. He said uh, mm -hmm. that that individual was not uh, welcome in Canada nor were any people you know, in his family or others like him welcome in Canada. That was a pretty um, you know, strong message Strong message on the part of the Prime Minister. Um, what's important to note about Canada is that we're a country that cherishes the principle of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. um, the law is bigger, more important than one person's opinion. That is to say that whatever I think, whatever the Prime Minister thinks, whatever the Minister of Justice thinks, uh, we don't have... At the have end of the day, there's a law. There are laws. And in the end, at the end of the day, whether we like someone or don't like someone, it's not on the simple word of a minister or the Prime Minister that someone will be picked up, yeah. put on okay. a plane, and sent halfway around the world. Clear. So, you know, we have a, a rules-based system. Uh, we're working very closely with the Tunisian government on uh, sharing information that can be helpful to us, mm -hmm. both on the question of assets yeah. and on the question of individuals that might be of interest to the Tunisian government. 
Your Excellency, finally, what is your message to the thousands of Tunisians and expats who are listening to you on FTC? Well, first of all, I'm uh, delighted to be able to speak to them. I'd say a particular word to those uh, Tunisians and Canadian, to Tuniso Canadians who are uh, listening who are in Canada mm -hmm. uh, and wish them in particular uh, a happy Canada Day. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd say to Tunisians uh, listening is that um, I'd say thank you. Uh, thank you for um, having uh, given me the chance to know your country for the past three years. I've been very privileged to live among you for the last three years, to discover the warmth of this country, the warmth of its people, mm -hmm. to see it at a period of unique change in its recent history. Um, and uh, as I said uh, during our National Day reception a couple of days ago, I may be leaving Tunisia. Uh, but Tunisia isn't leaving me, so <laughs> there'll be a piece of Tunisia that will always be with me and with my wife and my children. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you don't spend three years or even a year or two years in a country without taking some of that back with you. So for that, I'm very grateful for the privilege of having served here for the last uh, three years. I'm extraordinarily honored and uh, appreciative both of uh, my government for giving me the trust that it gave me to do so, mm -hmm. but uh, as much to the Tunisian people for welcoming me as they have. Your Excellency, I know that you have to leave the studio because you have a busy schedule, and please stay tuned to RTCI. We will call a Canadian businessman living in Tunisia, Mr. Bob Fox. Thank you for accepting the invitation, and have a nice National Day. Thank you.